Well, Shalom Alakim. We're at Mishnah 18 of Pirkei Avot, Chapter 1, and uh, we want to uh, try to finish. And then maybe the next time we're together, we'll be in Chapter 2 and continue on. I'm actually very surprised that we finished Chapter 1 so quickly. We're using Rabbi Tuvia Basser's work called Pirkei Avot, uh, based on the commentaries of the Maharal of Prague. Page 59 is where we're at. I want to read the, uh, he says, Mishnah 18, the author's introduction. Now that means the introduction from Rabbi Tuvia Basser. This is his introduction to the study of this Mishnah, okay? Let's just read it. I'm not sure I can add actually in anything to it. Oh, it would be helpful if we turn over and read the Mishnah first so that we have it in mind. Suddenly, it's not Shimon Beno, not Shimon his son. It's Shimon or Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel. Now he's not giving us advice about growing up among the sages. He's telling us something from the Torah, something really, really profound from the Torah. The world endures on three things: on justice, on truth, and on peace. As it is said, and this is a quote from Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, chapter 8 and verse 16, where it says, Emet, umishpat, shalom. Okay? Shiftu b'sharechem. It literally says truth. And, and this is translating, it says, truth and the verdict of peace are you to adjudicate in your gates. But, but if, I, if, if we give a word-for-word -word translation of the verse, it says truth, Emet, truth, Umishpat and justice, shalom, peace, shift u, uh, shif, shifetu, excuse me, shifetu, be echem, will be judged or will be, the, the, this is the basis of all judgments in your gates, all right? That's, that's basically what it said. Now, let's move back to the author's introduction on page 59 and see what Rabbi Basser has to say to us. God continuously sustains the existence of the world. We know that from Mishnah too. Actually, the very second Mishnah, if you remember, if we look back, let's look back and read it real quickly. Uh, I will for you. Yeah, the second Mishnah, where it should say Shimon HaTzadik. Yeah, Shimon HaTzadik was among the survivors of the Great Assembly, and he used to say the world depends on three things, on Torah study, on the service of Hashem, and on kind deeds, giving uh, giving chasadim, okay? Now, Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel is telling us something else. He's not telling us how it depends, he's saying how it endures. It endures on these three things. These, uh, he says, God continuously sustains the existence of the world. Mishnah too stated that the world actually, the world exists, this is the way Rabbi Basar is seeing it, the world itself, it exists to support the goodness of mankind. And that's, that's right, that's another, that's looking at it from a different direction, but it's the same thing. Mishnah 18 informs us that mankind not only warrants we deserve the existence of the world, if by the way we are doing those things. Torah study, the service of God, and giving the chasadim, the deeds of loving kindness. So we not only warrant the world's existence, but we also, uh, mankind also is a vehicle to maintain its existence. We also know that from great statements of the sages which talk about how, uh, you know, the uh, worlds that were destroyed previous to the creation of this particular world was destroyed because people refused to accept the Torah. And that's this same idea. The Maharal, he says, provides several analyses of this Mishnah, three of which will be presented here. One, the first analysis focuses on how the institutions of justice, truth, and peace maintain the primary aspects of human society. The second analysis demonstrates how justice, truth, and peace, which sustain the world, correspond one for one with, in other words, there is a correspondence between them, one for one, with Torah, acceptance and study of Torah, service of God, and kindness, which warrants sustained existence, as stated in Mishnah 2, in the Mishnah of Shimon HaTzadi. The third explanation, he says, takes an entirely different approach. It explains how justice, truth, and peace 
correspond to the basic elements of the creation. And this is how he sees those basic elements. The creator, the created, and the purpose of creation. That's, that's a really sharp thing he's actually saying here, uh, uh, how, that, how that works. So we'll, we'll get into it when we turn the page. A human being, he says, is only that which he is born with. What are we born with? A body and a soul. Everything else is acquired as that human being grows. For, uh, for wealth and even knowledge, they are only acquisitions. Okay, they're only things that you make. That, that whether it's money or whether it's more and more knowledge. In total, he says, a, a person is made up of three components. The person himself, material possessions like money, and spiritual possessions such as intellect, sekel. This is why the Maharal sees the intellect up here because this is where the soul is residing and thinking and working and that this is a spiritual thing not necessarily a physical thing the three things of this Mishnah he says are directed at those three components of human existence all right which is justice truth and peace okay the world endures on three things justice truth and peace the Maharal the, now we're now we're in the commentary of the Maharal how do these three things influence the life of a human being? The institution of justice maintains an orderly system, he says, of personal wealth. That's really what it's about. So that people, you, you, you don't lose everything. So that there's a sense of right and wrong and punishments for thieves and whether they're whether they're an armed robber or, or uh, one who's coming in the back door and stealing everything corporately or anything like that. This is really what, these kind of disputes is what courts of justice are all about. By the way, this is a, this is a Noahide commandment. This is a B'nai Noah commandment as well as a commandment of the Torah uh, for the Jewish people is to establish courts of justice, all right? He says, the institution of justice maintains, maintains an orderly system of personal wealth. The pursuit of truth, emet, enriches the intellect. Now put all these things together. Truth, there's only really one thing that's truth, and that's God. And what we have is his word. That's truth, that's emet. Because he is in the word. Okay, that's, that's the idea. And uh, that enriches the intellect. In other words, it, this is something spiritual, not something physical. All right? The pursuit of peace enhances our personal existence, he says, by ensuring that one person's domain of existence doesn't encroach on his neighbor's existence. Now he says, let's explain those things in detail. The world endures first al-hadin, on justice, what, what they're translating is justice, but literally it means judgment, okay, deen is a judgment. The creator has allocated possessions, he says, to each of us, and it is improper for one person to take what God has intended for another. Competent justice maintains proper allocation of material possessions and enables the world to endure in the way that God planned for each person. Without this system of justice, then the property of one person would come into the hands of someone else, and the material possessions component of human existence would be abrogated. Now remember, this is just the first approach. We're going to take three different approaches here. On truth, okay? Ve'al ha'emet. When one pursues truth, intellect emerges into the world. But when falsehood prevails, then the, intellectuals, the intellectual side of life is abrogated. It's not good for you spiritually. Ve'al ha'shalom, and on peace. Peace, he says, addresses the human being himself. The world requires peace to endure because it is an intrinsic part of human nature to have conflicts with one another, with other people. Each of us believes, he says, from birth, 
You know, I know all of us are going to say, well, I don't, but <laughs> the majority of people in the world, let's put it that way. I, I won't accuse the people in the class. <laughs> but each of us believes from birth that everything is mine. And conflict arises because the, the very existence of other people interferes with me and mine. In summary, he says, the world supports human existence in three categories, material possession, intellect, and the person himself. Judgment, truth, and peace secure those three things, and as a result, they prevent the world from collapsing. All right, that's one level of looking at the words of Rabban Shimon ben Gamaliel. Let's look at another one. This is the second analysis. Shimon HaTzadik, in Mishnah number two, listed three pillars that are the origin and the foundation of the world because they support the flow of existence. Remember, now this is just, we have to think correctly. All existence flows from God. The support for all existence, not only is he the creator of it all, he sustains it all. If it was not for that constant flow of shefa, of abundance from him, it wouldn't exist. Amen. All right? So, he says, Shimon HaTzadik listed three pillars because they support the flow of existence from God as follows. The service of God, and actually what we know of that, the service of God, if you'll remember back then, really has to do with the temple service, which is where the Shefa actually, actually connects to this physical world. Today, it's even in the days of the temple service when sacrifices were being made at the same time, we also connected to that in our personal lives was the prayer service that we do. So we continue the prayer service, and this is, this is something that keeps the chef from flowing. Mm. But the service of God, he said, links mankind to the Creator. Torah makes people worthy of existence, and that goes, this the Maharav is telling us, and that goes with so many Midrashim we find out about why previous worlds were created, because no Torah. And the flow of acts of kindness, this is what Shimon HaTzadik said, the flow of acts of kindness from one to another, that induces the flow of kindness from God to the world. Why? Because we're actually, when we're doing that, we are becoming more like Him, we are able to cleave to Him. This is all, we could, all, we could sit here and analyze all of these things also based upon the analysis from the will to receive for yourself alone, being transformed into a will to receive in order to please Hashem and in order to share with others. I mean, it fits, it fits just perfectly, okay? He says, uh, so, so the question of the Maharal is, is why is his list, why is Shimon HaTzadik? His question is, Shimon HaTzadik says, says the service of God, the Torah, and Gemilu Chasadim, that's what sustains the world. That's what the world rests on, these three pillars. Uh, and of course, uh, Shimon ben Gamliel, Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel says, justice, truth, and peace. So the Maharal's question is, why is his list different than Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel's list in this Mishnah? So he's going to try to answer it. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel lists the things through which God maintains the world. Okay? The origin of the world is what, actually, the reason everything is created and the way it works and the connections between it. This is what Shimon HaTzadik is talking about in the second Mishnah. As far as the maintenance of the world, this is what Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel is, is listing. However, he says, we will now show that the three pillars of the world's origin from Shimon HaTzadik, they correspond directly to the three components of the world's maintenance. In other words, actually, they're still the same thing. All right? Service of God, the Maharal says, corresponds to justice or judgment. Both of these activities, he says, serve God uh, in the world, as opposed to enriching the person himself or, or bestowing a kindness upon others. This, in this case, just judgment. The rabbis say, and then now he's quoting from the Talmud in Shabbat uh, 10a, that every judge who judges a sincere case correctly becomes a partner with the Holy One, blessed is He, in the creation. In fact, everything that we're doing, all of them, it's voted this way. All of them. That we are partners with Hashem in the creation. Why? Because the mitzvot also are part of sustaining the world. 
and we can move on in that because they they also are a way to move to move the roots <laughs> of things from the side of judgment of harsh judgment over to the side of Chesed or move them closer to Chesed to, that it sweetens the judgment all of those things all of them are that way. He says, just as ser the service of God in prayer and mitzvot, commandments, establishes a link with the Creator, so too does honest judgment, justice, maintain a par partnership with the Creator. There are other examples, he says, of the close association between justice and the sacrificial service of the Holy Temple. For example, now he's quoting from a Rashi, from a Rashi commentary to uh, his commentary to Shmot 21.1, Exodus 21.1. Why was the portion in, and this is from Rashi, why was, in the, why was the portion in the Torah of Judgments, uh, this is the portion, Mishpatim, okay, in the Torah, Parashat Mishpatim, placed next to the portion that deals with the altar? And Mishpatim, by the way, means justices or judgments. Why was it next? If, you, if we look in the Torah, in Shemot, those two, those two are together. That that talks about the, how the altar is made in the Mishkan and a Torah portion called Mishpatim, meaning judgments or, or justices. To teach us, Rashi says, that the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, no higher court than this, okay, convenes near the altar. Why is all that? Because they're connected. They're doing the same kind of thing, in other words. In other words, the judgment that, that was being made in the court of the Sanhedrin, or in any other court for that matter, is the same kind of judgment that's actually being carried out on the whole, uh, on animal sacrifice on the holy altar. It has to do with the separation of good from bad, and, and this is a whole other lesson. We're not going to go there right now, but it, it but it really and that's often what a judge is doing. You know that he is listening to all the case, listening to everything, and then he is separating out from it the good <laughs> from the bad. In making, in literally making a judgment on what's the what's the answer, what's the best, what's the best way to go on this, what's uh, what's the way to proceed, so that the good can be salvaged and the bad done away with. And it's, it's an interesting way to look at it. And this, and what what the Maharaj is trying to say is this is the same thing as the service of Hashem. Okay. Conversely, it says the rabbis considered incompetent judgment, a judge who's incompetent or corrupt, that it was similar to serving idols. Now he's going to quote from, from the, uh, the passage in the Talmud, Sanhedrin 7b, who's, which says, one who appoints an improper judge in a place of Torah scholars is like one who plants an Asherah, that was a tree that was worshipped by idolaters, besides the altar, an Asherah. So we see how this is connected. We often don't think of it. Well, I mean, why would we ever think of it that way? But it's true. It's, it's, there, there's a total connection. The Torah, okay, so justice, judgment slash justice corresponds to service of God. The Torah corresponds to truth. Torah itself is truth, and there is no truth like the Torah, the Maharal says. Just as Torah improves the person himself, so does the pursuit of truth perfect a person. So he's, he's basically showing us that the terms are, that there is a correspondence between the terms, between Mishnah number two and Mishnah 18. Acts of kindness, or Gemilut Chasadim, that corresponds to Al Hashalom, uh, peace, because kindness brings peace among people. Just as the goodness of acts of kindness makes the world worthy of existence, so does the pursuit of peace keep this world a place of goodness. Okay? Now, third analysis, and we're going to have to move on or I won't get through. I, I would really like to talk about more about these things, but let's, let's move on because the Maharal has a lot to teach us here. The third perspective, the third layer, there are three elements, he says, to a constructive act. There is the creator, element number one. There is the created. And then there is the purpose of the creation, why it was created. The three things of this Mishnah may also be understood as a reference to each of these elements of God's creation. Justice, 
addresses the world from the aspect of the Creator, who decrees change as a judge issues decrees that must be followed. For this reason, the divine name Elohim, which denotes a judge, that is the one that is used throughout the biblical narrative of creation. Interesting, because they t the rabbis tell us, as I'll tell us, that when Hashem originally created the world, He created it according to strict justice. Okay, then He saw, uh-oh, uh, it, 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 it won't be able to exist that way. So He inserted the four-letter name, which stands for mercy. So, but it's still, it's a combination of mercy and strict justice. And Hashem Elohim is one. It's all, it's all one. It's wrong for us to think of him really in two separate ways. Uh, I, I want to make that point because some people, because of these two separate names, they think of him almost like two separate beings joined at the hip, and that's not so. Hashem, mercy, Elohim, justice are one. All right? Okay. But anyway, you see what he is saying. This is justice would con would would uh, be towards the aspect of Elohim, the Creator. Okay, the institution he says of justice maintains the decrees by which the world was created, as the, as Hazal have said. And now he quotes from uh, the Talmud in, in um, uh, Shabbat 10a. Every judge who judges a true well, we we saw this already. Every judge who judges a sincere or a true case correctly becomes a partner with the Holy One, blessed is he, in creation, they say. Therefore, if the world did not embody justice, it would have inevitably collapsed. Truth, the next thing, refers to the structure that the Creator imposed on the creation. It addresses the world from the aspect now of the created, which runs according to the consistent and equitable rules of creation. You, you understand? See, that's why that's truth is important to us. Believe me, Hashem, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem our God knows the truth. It's us that have to pursue this and find it. So this is from the aspect, remember we have creator, then created, then purpose of creation. This is from the aspect of the creation itself. The decree of the true judge is truth itself. And the world, which is the object of the, God's decree, it has to embody truth or eventually it will collapse. Now peace, shalom. Peace is achieved when all is complete and there is no need for any further development or change. This fact is seen, he says, in the common root of the Hebrew words for peace, shalom, and complete or perfect, which is shalem. Peace is the, it's the, they're the same concepts. Peace is the purpose of creation. I never thought of it this way, but he's, he's absolutely correct. Just as peace is also the purpose and the fulfillment of justice and, and the result of truth. <laughs> you know when we'll have peace in the Middle East? When truth is, when tr when, when truth is, is presented and believed mm -hmm. and no more lies. That's when, that's when we can have peace. Yeah, for sure. Okay. As long as we're operating under the, under the big lies that are told over and over and over again, which are not truth at all, there will be absolutely no peace, no matter what. But look how he, put, look how he picks this up. It's so, it's so neat, the Maharal. At the conclusion of the six days of creation and continuous development, God instilled into creation the ability to desist from change. Peace arrived when the creation was complete because the narrative of the creation, and this is from Bereshit 2.2, says, and he concluded on the seventh day, he finished, is what it says, on the seventh day his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. It's talking about the Shabbat. The Midrash comes and deals, he says, with the paradox that creation was, was actually advanced yet further on the seventh day, even though God rested 
on the seventh day. How was it advanced? That's the question. The answer is, what was, what was or the question is, what was created after Hashem rested? What was created on the Shabbat? How did it continue to go on towards completion on the Shabbat? And the answer is tranquility was created, repose, peace, and quiet. That's what was created on the seventh day. Rashi comes and highlights that creation actually became a stable entity on that day when he comments, what did the world lack is his question. And the answer, he answers rest. When the Shabbat comes, then rest comes. So peace is actually not a part of the creation itself because Shabbat is not included among the seventh day, is not included among the six days of creation. Therefore, peace, he says, which is a spiritual entity, occupies a higher level in the hierarchy of existence than does the physical world. And this is what makes Shabbat so important. Uh, and he, he makes a note down here. He says, just as Shabbat or Shabbos is a higher level than the weekdays, the physical world is subject to change, not on the Shabbat. Peace denotes completeness and stability, which, uh, which is akin to sechel. He says, uh, intellectual, spiritual growth. But the, do, we, do we get his idea? This is what makes the Shabbat different. A world with no peace, so this is the purpose of creation, is actually to have peace. A world with no peace would collapse. And this is the third aspect of creation, namely peace, as it fulfills the purpose of creation. Let me quickly give to you. Wow. You know, actually, we may wait. Let me wait on this, and the next time we're together, because it's, there's a little too much, I think, for me to tackle. In the, how many minutes, Jason? Three. I can't do it in three minutes. No way. Uh, so if it's okay with you, we'll, we'll close that out. We'll look at the relationship of this Mishnah 18 to all of the rest of the Mishnah Yot of chapter 1. We'll also look at, uh, there are some missing generations here in chapter 1. And then, uh, then uh, Rabbi uh, Tuvia Basar wants to give us a summary of the first chapter of Pirkei Avot. I'm going to tell you in advance that I'm not going to tackle, I'm, I'm going to read it to you, but I'm not going to tackle to try to explain uh, the the final, you know, at the beginning of every chapter of, the, of Pirkei Avot, there's a certain saying, all Israel has a share in the world to come. At the end, there's also a certain saying, at the end of every chapter. Rabbi Hananiah ben Akashia says, the Holy One, blessed is he, wished to confer merit upon Israel. So, he gave them Torah and mitzvot in abundance. He gave them a lot of Torah and a lot of mitzvot. Uh, as it is said, and he quotes from Isaiah 42:21, Hashem desired for the sake of his righteousness that the Torah be made great and glorious. So there's all kinds of different ways of looking at that. I don't want to get into this tired argument over and over again, you know, that those crazy Jews, they're working for salvation and all mm -hmm. that stuff. I mean, that's, not, that's not what that's about in any shape, form, or fashion. And so, uh, I mean, we've been over that time and time and time again. Uh, Grace has always been around. It's not a creation of 2,000 years ago. You know, I mean, it's not something God had an afterthought, you know, and said, oh, I forgot about that little thing. I might ought to, I might ought to interfere in the world's existence and get that in there. Anyway, yeah, right. Anyway, so, so I, I, I don't want to get into all those arguments. All right, so anyway, I'm enjoying this very much. I hope you are. We'll, we'll finish it quickly the next time we're together, and we'll start Chapter 2, which will be exciting, I'm sure. Chapter 2. All right, Shalom and Rakata, you peace and a blessing. Bye-bye. Sure, sure.